All right, everyone. We're finishing heart week. I mean, heart section. Uh, so next week, I will talk to you guys about the immune system. Good stuff. Put in and talk about vaccines and COVID, things like that. Put that in there. Uh, so hopefully, the lab, you guys have done the labs that are going to be helping with heart anatomy. And next week's will be heart function. And yeah, that's, that's our plan. I'm just hoping you guys have studied it and uh, feeling good about it. And today, I'm going to uh, I'll just do a little review of ECG and then I'll get into uh, blood pressure and such. I put a lecture up last night or yesterday on uh, the vessels of the heart, my last lecture on that. Uh, and vessels of the body, I'm sorry, the last lecture for this. Um, I have one uh, full brother, Steve, and uh, he's an artist. <laughs> and uh, I'm not an artist at all. And uh, he had a whole series of uh, heart things. And he, he made this for me. These are big cans that are this assembly jar from, from things. And uh, that's kind of cool. That's, yeah, that's he does. Neither one of us worked very hard. Uh, but yeah, we're happy. <laughs> all right. So this, uh, we'll see. I'm getting the computer people kind of fight with me uh, that uh, the next two weeks we can uh, look at your ECG in the lab and such, and you can see it should be familiar. I mean, the big old peak there is that QRS complex, which your ventricles contracting. And then this first peak is a P, that's the atria contracting, and there's the delay, and the QRS, the big, huge ventricles, big electrical activity. Little delay, and the T wave is when ventricles are relaxed. Yeah, you can measure a uh, heart rate from this. I mean, just measure these peaks. Each one of these peaks, this is one heartbeat, if you will. And then if you, um, so the amount of these that you have in a minute will be how many beats per minute. About 60 seconds, like that, almost. And then you can look at ECGs to tell, you can tell some other things. Oh, sorry, I'm not here. Um, right. And then if you listen to heart sounds, love dub, love dub, love dub. You should know where they would be on an ECG, like at what point in time. So the first sound will be right after the ventricles contract. So it's going to be the big uh, bicuspid and uh, tricuspid snap. Then after the ventricles relax, the second sound should be over here. When the ventricles relax, there's a suction and a aortic and pulmonary valve snap. So I'll put it all together for you. Hopefully, a little review. This is the what's going on with the electric activity of the heart. The sounds in there. And then hopefully in lab, we can hook you up to an ECG and then uh, put a microphone in your chest so you can see the heart sounds. And then uh, a pulse transducer on your finger, you'll be able to see how your pulse is going to be like, you know, just a little bit of delay. Your heart contracts, then you feel the pulse in your finger. You feel it quicker in your neck, actually. It takes a little time for that pulse wave to be. Cool. I'm looking at here a nice little smoother ECG. And again, the x-axis is time, right? So you can measure time by counting the squares and you'll keep the way you used to do it. And then eighth bit here, you can see that's just more regular and there's no real P wave. It's just all kind of fibrillating. And everyone's talking at once and it's not really coordinated. Oh, I should show you this one. Can we see this in lab? I'm going to guess we have something wrong with the equipment because that's you're dead, right? <laughs> Asystole. Okay, so nothing there, right? About this, practice, and you guys are not experts. You can see this uh, uh, P uh, PR interval gets longer, longer. We lost the whole PRS complex there. And I mentioned in lectures is a block. It doesn't have what kind of time. That's a block. There's something keeping that signal from uh, from reaching the the people. Yeah, no, this is deadly. It's not aphid. Defib. Your ventricle is a fibrillate. You're going to die when someone shocks that heart back. Because the ventricles, they need to go. I mean, they need to go to push the blood out nicely. Atria, they, they kind of help a little bit. I mean, they, they help, of course, but the, the ventricles are the problem. Then you all should know this. If I showed you this, you should be able to give me one word that describes this condition. Are you guys thinking? No? Tachycardia. Yeah, it's a, too fast. Don't worry about what kind of tachycardia. Bradycardia would be too slow on a We call tachycardia over 100, bradycardia less than 60, but obviously, they're not very good. 
And then I uh, left you talking about uh, cardiac output. So last time, so we're gonna uh, get to that uh, right now. That's how much blood the heart pumps out in a minute. It's gonna be the output. All right. So let's stop sharing that. Is that my big face up there? No, it's not, okay, good. Um, Don't you guys worry, I know what I'm doing. Yes. I was a little nervous about it. Yeah. All right, so. You guys are resting now, you're sitting, or you can jump up on the treadmill. Your cardiac output is going to be changed a lot. And your resting is about five liters every minute. You're like, but you can crank that up to 10 liters, 30 liters, 40 liters a minute. So your heart, if it's really pumping, can, can push a lot more blood in your muscles to deliver oxygen, etc. And again, simply, cardiac output is how much blood is pumped out of your heart per minute. Got it? And it's a simple formula. This has two variables. It's going to be heart rate times stroke volume. And stroke volume is how much blood is ejected out of the heart. And it makes sense. If I was to ask you guys, what's your speed if you're running a race? It would be your number of strides per minute by how long your strides are. So you can be taller with longer legs, or you can just move your legs faster. It also has to do with speed. Yeah. And uh, stroke volume is how much is pushed out of the ventricles. And when I first started studying this, I thought, well, of course, the, the ventricles are empty. That's what you read. The ventricles are empty, and systole, then they fill up again. But actually, about 60% is pushed out, and then you're left with that remaining. The end systolic volume is left. You don't completely empty them. There's only some 50 or so uh, milliliters stuck in there each time. But the stronger your heart, the better your stroke volume. So those of you with big athletic hearts, flexible, with each heartbeat, you push out, even at 70, push out 80, something like that. What does that mean? That means to keep the same cardiac output as that person that's not in shape, your heart rate can be lower. Because with each beat, you push out more blood, you can have fewer beats per minute. And if your heart is, is, is crap, if you only push it out like 40 milliliters of heart, you have to up your heart rate to compensate. So see, it's just two variables, heart rate and stroke blood. If you're athletic, you have a big, strong heart, and you have a bigger stroke volume, you can have a lower heart rate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, it goes together. It's pretty good. All right, so that's stroke volume. How much you can push up? Um, obviously, bigger hearts push out more. So we can average about 70 milliliters. Let's just say that. And then let's just like get average 70 beats per minute to heart rate. So it is again about five liters per minute. It's so easy to remember. That's about the average amount of blood a person has in the body. So every minute, all the blood in your body goes to your body. Five liters per second. But, yeah, you freaking get on that treadmill and start running a race, you can up it like that, double or triple, like 40 meters. So your heart has the ability to speed up and contract stronger. And then during recovery, after it rests, it's going to go down. You're going to so it's beautiful. The pump and it's variable. You can uh, crank it up or uh, turn it down. Yeah. Not all the complex math. Your output is going to be heart rate times the stroke bar, how much you push up. Well, let's talk about some things like you know, how do you control the heart rate stroke bar? Well, this is your sympathetic nervous system. At the end of last semester, I talked about nervous system. And uh, sympathetic nerves go right to the pacemaker of your heart. And right to the muscle of your heart. And uh, the neurotransmitter is epinephrine or norepinephrine, adrenaline. And the adrenaline is going to speed up the heart rate. And cause the heart to con contract more strongly. And what's slowing it down is the parasympathetic system. It turns out to be this is cranial nerve 10, is the vagus. When I taught you that last semester, I said, 
We're gonna re revisit the vagus a lot. It's the only cranial nerve that leaves the head and goes all the way down the body. And it goes to your guts. So you help digest and relax and slow your heart rate. Yeah. And so there's a branch of the vagus nerve going right to the pacemaker of the heart. And if you remember, and I'll review again for you guys, um, remember which one's the pacemaker that keeps the pace, which node? Is it AV? The SA node, yeah. The SA node is in charge. And it wants to go 100 beats a minute. But the vagus nerve is whispering to it. So it only goes about 70 normal or 60. Yeah. That's the deal. And so if you have more stimulation from the vagus nerve, it's going to slow it down even more. Or if the vagus nerve like, lets off a little bit, it'll speed up. So you can see you got some control here. And obviously, if you have either the sympathetic uh, nerve, it'll speed it up, or the adrenaline in your field. Right? Same thing, because it's the same transmitter. It's going to speed up the heart. All right, so remember, vagus nerve, parasympathetic, slows the heart. Sympathetic or adrenaline speeds up the heart. And that's what it says there. And the, the chemical for the parasympathetic is acetylcholine and uh, epinephrine. Adrenaline will give you speed up. And of course, you know, you can have an adrenaline rush and you feel your heart rate go up. You can get uh, an epi pen or a, a syringe full of epi and you can speed up the heart, you know, but not too hard to speed up the heart. All right. And of course, also, don't forget body temperature. The warmer you are, your heart rate goes up. If you're obviously anxious or excited, your heart rate goes up. Um, yeah. Now, I'm just telling you, heart rate goes up or down. I put a couple a slide here just to show you how does it actually, what's the mechanism? Sure, I can tell you that, you know, adrenaline speeds up your heart rate, but I'll show you how it actually happens. So these pacemakers in your heart, they're just modified cardiac muscle, and they, um, they've got their own beat, their own rhythm. It's really slow, but they'll just go on their own, or myogenic or autorhythmic, they've got their own kind of beat going on. So what happens is, you know, like a skeletal muscle, you need a, a signal from the nervous system, but these ones go on their own. And so there's some threshold, remember that threshold at negative 55 and on this threshold, once it's hit, then the, um, the, the pacemaker fires electricity. And then it comes back down again. And then it slowly is leaking, leaking ions until it fires again. So it goes on and on and on. It fires, it comes back down, and it takes a while, it leaks, 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 and it fires. That's a typical pacemaker. Now, what you can do to speed up or slow it down is let's look at this one. The black is the normal. So if you want to speed it up, that's the red. If you want to speed up, don't. Um, don't depolarize it so fast. Don't go down too far. And then it's quicker to reach that threshold. If you want to slow it down in the blue, just have it like hyperpolarized. So it takes longer to reach that threshold. So that's the mechanism. You can see how it's done. It's going to fool with the, uh, the channels for calcium and uh, potassium and sodium. And you can um, either make it closer to threshold or go faster. Or hyperpolarize that sucker so it's really going to take longer to come back at that threshold. Ah, I don't know if I needed to tell you that. Okay. All right, so all day long, you guys are sitting there right now. Your uh, medulla, your brain, is uh, measuring your blood pressure. Constant measuring of the blood pressure. And the kind of receptor that measures pressure is called a baroreceptor. Baroreceptor is pressure. And if I ask you where in the body do you measure your blood pressure, you should tell me at the, the arch of the aorta, right the aorta here. And then in your carotid artery, I just put a push. But your carotid artery is the big artery in the neck. It's going to split and have a crotch and it's kind of like a swelling. So in this carotid sinus, it's like where the carotid arteries are, and then on the arch of the aorta, there's nerves that go into your medulla. Remember, the medulla is the base of your brain, it's your brain stem. And that's where you have important things like heart rate, and breathing, vomiting, blood pressure, you know, all these things are sent to the life. And so there's a cardiac center there that is measuring your blood pressure constantly. Even when you guys, like in the morning, when you sit up, 
your blood pressure is going to drop. And so it's going to sense it, send it to the medulla, it's going to send it to the heart, your heart's going to speed up as soon as you wake up. It's sit up. And uh, you can see, I mean, these words are pretty easy. The cardio accelerator is going to speed up your heart. The cardio inhibitor center is going to slow it down. Cool. Yeah. And so if you have dangerously high blood pressure, if you're like, if your aorta is just stretched, if your carotid is stretched, ready to blow a gasket, you know, that is sent, that information is sent to the, uh, to your, to your brain. And it's going to, the inhibitor center is going to say, whoa, slow down the heart, you know. It's going to open up your vessels. It's going to lower your blood pressure. Do everything that it can because you get too hot. And if it's in too low, say so you feel like you're going to faint, you just stood up. That goes there too. It's going to speed up your heart. It's going to constrict your vessels so that's going to raise your blood pressure. Yeah, you guys, it's behind the scenes. It's autonomic. You don't think about it. So your blood pressure is always being measured, and uh, your brain is being pulled on it, and your brain is reacting. Ooh, I'll test some of you guys from your cranial nerves you memorized last semester. Number 10 is the biggest. What about number nine? <laughs> Go through your head. Oh, it take a while. Everybody, the glossopharyngeal. I wasn't one of the stars, but uh, it's uh, going to come in, and then you know the sensory going to go into the vagus and that glossopharyngeal, and then you can see here's the vagus coming out, going to slow down the heart, and the sympathetic nerve going to speed up, depending on what it is. All right. Beautiful. Um, a little more detail here. You don't need to know about. I'll talk about these are adrenaline receptors and these are uh, acetylcholine receptors. And uh, I talked about it last semester a little bit. But uh, mainly, your medulla has this cardiovascular center, cardiac center. And uh, if you go sympathetic, you're going to release adrenaline, and it's going to it's going to increase rate depolarization. It's going to speed up the heart rate. It's going to think it's going to fire more often. On the other hand, you secrete acetylcholine. And uh, it's going to hyperpolarize. Like I say it's going to do it even more, so it takes longer to hit that threshold than you All right. Any questions there? Blood pressure always monitored. We'll talk about hypertension and high blood pressure at the end of the lecture today. All right, there's something cool about the heart. It's called the Frank Starling Law of the cardiac muscle of the heart. And uh, the deal, if you remember, we talked about the muscles contracted. Uh, where do you get the most power? I asked you, is it when it's fully stretched out, like it's my biceps, or in the middle, or when it's almost? When do you have the most actual power? The answer was in the middle, when the muscle is intermediately stretched, you have the most cross connection. That is power. Now, in heart muscle, it's actually unique in that the more stretched it is, the stronger it contracts against it. The more stretched the cardiac muscle is, the harder it really, the stronger it contracts. And I'll tell you, bottom line for survival is that the amount of blood that comes back to your heart, the heart has to get rid of that same amount of blood. Now, if your heart can't handle it, if it can't get rid of the, the blood, it's going to back up. Right? And in a failing heart, that's exactly what happens. You can't get rid of the blood back up. So, the more the blood that returns to the heart, the more stretched it is. Cardiac muscle is going to oh, contract harder. If you got really low blood pressure, I'll say you bled out and you're like, you're almost, you have very little blood pressure, it's going to contract more slowly. So the muscle itself, um, the amount of stretch it is, how strong it contracts against that stretch. So looking at here, let's say normal resting values, you can see uh, uh, like 130 by 140 millimeters of turns. You're gonna see it normally gets rid of like 70, stroke volume of 70. That's totally that's the average. You know? But if you're like really working out, all of a sudden like 200 millimeters of blood return into the heart. Like it's being really pushed back. Then you can see the heart muscle will squirt out like over 100. So the heart reacts to muscle it's called Frank Starling Law of the Heart. Yeah. And it allows you to get rid of all the blood that comes to the heart. And again, I hope you guys are putting this all together. This stretchiness, how much returns to it, is going to be that going to be the end diastolic part. That's going to be when the ventricles, at the end of this relaxation, is 
plump and filled with blood. That's the end of diastole. Then systole starts to contract. And those of you that get into heart stuff, some of you are really interested in heart stuff, um, we call that the, 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 when it's completely stretched, the preload. That's like before it's going to contract. In case you guys want to put all of it together, once the ventricles contract, the blood is squirted out. And then um, the amount of pressure that's needed to push the blood out the aorta will be after load. Yes, yeah, hopefully pay attention. If you have high blood pressure normally, your heart's got to work harder to shoot that blood out of the ventricle, doesn't it? Because the back pressure in that aorta is bigger. If you have low blood pressure, it's easier on the heart because it can easily push it out. But if there's a lot of normally high blood pressure, the heart's got to push harder to pump it out. What's the big deal with when you have high blood pressure? You have to work high, the heart's got to work harder to pump. All right, so here, look at this part. Some of you guys recognize the SA node is in charge, right? It is the AD node, it's kind of like a little delay switch. So you know, the signal comes here, the delay goes down here. And if you guys notice this, let's take a look at this. Notice the difference between the blue and the green. The blue just goes to the two nodes, right? The green goes to the two nodes and the heart muscle. So I just want you to know that sympathetic nervous system, adrenaline, makes both the speed of the heart and how, how powerful it contracts. The vagus nerve parasympathetic doesn't go to the heart muscle. So how strong your heart beats is based on if you have a lot of adrenaline or less adrenaline. Your pacemakers have adrenaline and cold. They're not like, oh, the pacemakers have a brake and a gas pedal. Your heart just has a gas pedal. You put it or you let it off. So, all right, so adrenaline, Either from your adrenal glands or from the nerves, is going to not only speed up the heart, but make the heart contract strong. All right, okay. All right, again, we just shifted all these different uh, subjects. All right, so venous return. So, this is the blood that returns to your heart. And I think I, I mentioned to you guys, but you got a big problem. Right? This, uh, your heart makes all the pressure to squirt out the blood to your body. That's cool. And then it goes through these vessels, and I'll show you. By the time it goes through the capillary, it really slows it down. And then it doesn't have much pressure. It's hard to get back to the heart because you've lost that blood pressure. The heart makes the blood pressure. And by the time it gets to the veins, it's got like hardly any pressure. So it's really hard to get the blood back to the heart, especially if you're standing upright. You get it back from your legs. God. Especially if you stand motionless for long periods of time, that blood pulls up in your legs. Uh, well, one way we get back is with uh, um, is that the, the valves, I mean, the veins in your legs, especially in arms, but they have valves in them, one way valves. So, as long as you're standing and moving around, uh, the muscles, your calf muscles, and your, your quads and your hamstring, are going to push the blood, squeeze it. It's going to squeeze these veins. And it can only go one direction, but it's going to push it up, and then it can't go back down again because these valves are shut. So it kind of keeps the blood kind of ratcheting up towards your body. That really helps with our limbs. I'm sure, right? It's hard to get that blood back. But if you guys are running, especially doing uh, athletic type activities, your muscles are really contracting, and those veins are getting squished, and the blood can only go one direction. The valves don't let it go down. So that's called the muscular pump in muscles. And also, your muscles are in these compartments, right? We we're talking about compartment syndrome in your leg. It's really tough fascia. And so the muscles, when they contract, they really squeeze the blood, too. And you can only go one way to get valves. Without valves, it would be useless because the blood would go up and down. It used to be squirted up and down. But with the valves, it keeps it moving up towards the heart. All right, the second one, you don't think about, but it's pretty cool. Respiratory pump. When you breathe in, a big breath in, what happens? Your diaphragm goes down, your chest comes out, and you make a vacuum. You guys know that, right? And what happens is that when you push your diaphragm down, it pushes out of your guts, and it makes a vacuum in your chest, and the blood gets sucked up into your chest. The bubble below. So whenever you take a deep breath, it pushes down your gut, and that blood gets under pressure, gets squeezed up into this chest, which is more of a vac, lower pressure. So just breathing, especially if you're running or exercising, is pushing the blood up. It's sucked up. You need to breath. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's see. Okay. 
and gravity is a factor too, of course. Um, you know, blood's going to return to your heart more if you're staring at your head, legs. Right? All right. Awesome. All right, so this should not be, this, none of this should be a surprise to you if you've uh, been listening. Your cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Either one of these can be, uh, can be changed. And of course, which one can you change more? You know, which one is easiest and can you double, triple? Your heart rate. The stroke volume you can increase, oh, maybe one and a half times. But your heart rate you can double, or triple. So, and also your heart rate, any idiot can not be in shape and increase the heart rate. The stroke volume is a matter of how strong your heart is, how much it can get. And that can improve with exercise. So heart rates, of course, is going to be uh, uh, slowed down by your vagus nerve or sped up by your uh, sympathetic nerves or adrenaline. And then stroke volume, a little more complicated, but it's how strong your, uh, your ventricles are contracting. So your uh, sympathetic nerves or adrenaline can, can do that. And then the natural Frank Starling law, the more stretch it is, the stronger it contracts. And how much it's, it's stretched has to do with venous return. How much blood is returning to that right atrium, your heart, the more it's going to stretch the heart out, it's going to make the muscle work harder. Right. And I see that this adrenaline also influences not only heart rate, but also the excitability. Yeah, you guys don't like calculate this when you go work out or take a, a math or something like that. Your body figures it out, right? And so it's pretty cool. All right, let's talk blood pressure. So blood pressure, if we see it, it turns out that you know, billions of people have in the world high blood pressure. But, um, so blood pressure is a big issue um, clinically. And this is all physics. Maybe somebody in physics class in lab, you, you model blood flow, you might do tubes and liquid and bubbles, things like that. Uh, I know something you guys talked about. So it's simply the pressure that's applied on the vessel walls. And you need it because the only way blood moves is it's going to move from high to low pressure, always high low pressure. And so the point of your heart muscle is to make high pressure so the blood moves. Now, of course. Um, when you take blood pressure, a lot of you, all of you have had your blood pressure taken, and I'm sure a lot of you have actually done this. Uh, in lab, we're going to use these ones that go on your wrist, digital readout. They're not such fun as listening, but because they're close. But the 120 over 80, that kind of thing, is going to be the high and the lowest pressure in your in your in your system. So um, in your artery. So systolic pressure is the highest going to be the 120. That's going to be the pressure when your ventricles contract. And then that low pressure is your diastolic. It's going to be when the ventricles are relaxing. Yeah, and you can feel this on my pulse right now. I can feel like each contraction, my systolic, diastolic pressure. And it never gets down to zero. It, it only comes out a little bit, like 120 over 80. That's awesome. Like, why does it keep staying that high? It's like, Constantly being pushed. The answer is because our arteries have elastic in them and they store the energy. Now, the formula, the two math formulas you need to know for blood pressure is going to be cardiac output times it's called peripheral resistance. It's the resistance to flow. Yeah, it's going to be the pressure. Yeah. And I'll let you know right now how we control this resistance. This is resistance to the blood, so flow. And so blood moving down a tube or any kind of liquid, like a big pipeline, oil pipeline, the longer the pipeline, the more resistance. Just as the friction as the fluid moves down against the wall. Uh, it's also to how thick it is. Like pumping oil or maple syrup, it's a lot harder than pumping water. Okay, so it's going to be that. And then the biggest one you're going to see is how big the tube is. If you try to suck up some uh, tea from a little tiny cocktail straw because it's a big straw, a lot less resistance with a big straw, right? So 
That's what we're talking about resistance. And that's gonna, it's gonna be the, the, the output's gonna be the pressure forcing it, and the resistance is gonna be. Exactly. That's kind of what I already told you it, but during diastole, this pause, it's going to be the ventricles are like a vacuum. They're opening up and um, it's going to be that low pressure. And then it's during systole, the ventricles are contracting, it forces the blood out of her. High pressure checks out of the heart to make sure I can feel my arteries bulge each time the heart beats. That pressure. I love it. All right. So this is what influences blood pressure. And you know, people with uh, high blood pressure, grandpa, you maybe, uh, you, these are going to be the factors that influence it. Um, number one is blood volume. It's like how much blood, how much fluid do you have? And so a lot of people that have high blood pressure, they have a big water pulse. And they're diuretic. And they can pee. So the amount of blood you have, simply put, is proportional to the pressure. So if you bled out, let's say you lost a lot of blood, your blood pressure is going to be really low. Your body's going to react. And if you have a bunch of salty chips and you're cleaning water, your blood pressure is going to be high, right? And so it's simply how much water and how much blood you have in the system. Uh, these two you guys know, this is the cardiac output. Either your heart rate goes faster or it goes stronger, is going to increase your blood pressure. Viscosity is how thick your blood is. Um, you can change that if you're really dehydrated or you're anemic or you've got a lot of blood proteins or few blood proteins. So your viscosity can change, but it doesn't change in an instant at all. But resistance does. Remember, resistance this is how you really influence your blood pressure. You do it by constricting your blood vessels or relaxing them, constricting or dilating your blood vessels. And that's going to have to do with resistance can be how big your pipes are. So if your blood pressure gain is too high, you relax your pipes. So they all get really big, and your blood pressure is going to drop. If you lost a lot of blood, your blood pressure is dangerously low. You constrict those vessels, and your blood pressure will come back up. We'll talk about resistance right. All right, so that's your blood pressure. The volume, the viscosity, your cardiac output, and then uh, the resistance to the blood. Well, you can feel your blood pressure. You can't measure, but you can feel whether it's uh, weak or strong by feeling your pulse. So my pulse, I can tell my heart rate, obviously. And every time I feel up my pulse, it's my heart. But also if it's weak, like if I have low blood pressure, it's strong, I have it. And you know, the radial pulse is a little common here. I wonder why would you ever use it on the foot? You know? Well, the patient's in the bed and their foot's right there, it's like easier to get the foot than to try to get out the hands. You can feel the pulse, your carotid pulse in the bed. Oh, yeah, I can feel it. So, there's places that you feel your pulse. Yeah, all right, let's see. Oh, I'll tell you this little glitch machine will take a bit. So, uh, this is what we would do in lab normally, but I, I, I don't think we're going to get out the old fashioned equipment here and use it. But this is a. Um, anyone's bell? This is. Big momomomomon. Big momomomon. All right. This thing measures blood pressure. In uh, the old fashioned days, you have a, a, a glass column of mercury in it, you have to measure the pressure. But uh, how it works is this very simple, very elegant, very cool. So you put a cuff on your arm and then you crank up the pressure until it completely stops blood flow to your hand. You're dead. Your hand is dead. You completely stop the blood flow. And uh, then you listen at the uh, this cubital fossa, you listen at your, your elbow. And as you release that pressure, you release that pressure, you're not going to hear anything until the pressure in that cuff is just enough so that the blood can start squirting out. So your blood pressure is high enough, so it's high enough to get past that pressure in the cuff. And you'll hear that as this tapping. Like, each time it squirts out, it's going to squirt out. So that blood squirting makes a sound called turbulence. You can hear the turbulence. Instead of laminar flow, which is smooth, you don't hear that. So if I hear my arm now, I hear nothing. But if I put a cuff on it, and I just let enough so that the blood is squirting out, I can hear that as these, this tapping. My cord pops out. 
if I keep listening, as soon as I hear the tapping, I, I pay attention to what that upper number is. That's the that systolic pressure. And if I keep listening, that tapping will get softer and softer and then disappear. But by that time, the pressure in the cup is so low that even diastolic pressure is just flowing normally. And then I close that, go harder than that. And so that's the old fashioned, that's the using a signal amounter uh, to estimate blood pressure. And I say estimate. Okay, if you really want to get true blood pressure, you can put a little uh, can, a little uh, pressure sensor, put it in an artery, you can actually measure directly. Right? This is kind of like a one step, a little bit of worse. Any questions on that? It's pretty, pretty simplistic. It's just as long as you know the pressure is this cup, you can wait and listen for that squirting that comes out when it's just strong enough to push past it. And it'll keep making that turbulent sound between systolic and diastolic. Then it gets quiet after diastolic because the blood's just flowing freely under a loose cup. All right, and then uh, they got the ones that go on the wrist with the little uh, LED. I think it shoots these little lights that are going to measure the capillaries and it'll measure that. Uh, whatever, so it's digital, works really well, but it's the old fashioned way. Uh, I'm just showing you some giraffe's heart. Uh, they got huge hearts. I want a moose heart. I know. You start somebody. Oh, you know, that's a big heart to have a lab. Um, but this thing has to pump blood, you know, 20 feet up in the air. If you guys know about pumps, it's really hard. You know, the gravity is so much awful. And then I'll show you pictures of a whale's heart. It looks like our heart or a sheep heart. Um, but it's just you know, male hearts all have four chambers. And stuff. All right. All right. You definitely need a break. Oh, definitely. Oh, you guys are very patient. All right. Let's take a little, our little four minute break. All right, 11.42, I'll start again.
We talked about ischemic or hemorrhagic when it's stroke in the head, either bleeding or it's a block of the clot. So, I want to ask you that on this one. All right, well, no questions. Uh, giving you a lot of stuff. Hopefully, you're, you're taking it in here. I'm talking about blood pressure. Let's get the blood pressure in more detail. So, here's another illustration just showing you that uh, here your aortic arch. In your carotid arteries, you have barrel receptors that are measuring pressure constantly. As you sit up, as you walk, as you sit down, as your blood pressure changes, and your medulla makes adjustments. All right, so here's a neat formula. It's cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. Blood pressure is that cardiac output times the resistance. And then, you know, just simply, this is your body, you know, keeping homeostasis. And this is critical, man. Your blood pressure, your body does a lot. Like the hormone system we learn, like EDH and epinephrine and aldosterone, all these things are going to be blood pressure. Because if your blood pressure is too low, your brain doesn't get blood and you pass out, right? Your kidneys don't work if your blood pressure is too low. Um, if your blood pressure is too high, you're going to blow an artery somewhere, get an aneurysm. You're going to, so you have to get that blood pressure right with various activities and resting and all these things and as your blood volume goes up and down. So keeping your blood pressure in your body's big survival is important. important, important. And of course, the pressure keeps the blood moving throughout your body. And so heart disease, number one killer in the US, uh, is because you know if you can't keep the blood moving, you can't keep your organs and your brain alive. So if you have too high a blood pressure, your body is going to slow down your heart and make it contract less. That's going to decrease your cardiac output. Or even, even simpler than that, you're going to see this decreased resistance. You just open up your arteries. You just relax them. Blood pressure is going to go down. You kind of think of it like a garden hose. At the end, you put that nozzle on. The pressure really increases. It doesn't. It? So in a big tube, there's not much pressure. If you go to a smaller tube, the pressure is going to increase. So by constricting your arteries, your pressure goes up. If you constrict the artery, the pressure is going to back up. If you open it up, the pressure is going to go down. So your body can really easily either increase or decrease that resistance by opening or closing your arteries. All right, this is a lot of words, but I've already told you these. So it's just you can like run your eyes over them. Um, but I, I, I told you all this to help you study. Um, yeah, you know, I buy all this. I buy all this. It's good. All right, enjoy. Um, I had an outline lecture I talked about, you know, the, uh, the anatomy of the vessels and stuff, but um, pretty much I'll remind you here that uh, the arteries have big, muscular, thick walls. And that's where the high pressure is. And then the veins, they need to be bigger, but they're with the very thin walls, but there's not much pressure left. And if I ask you on the test, importantly, you know, capillaries were all the diffusion. That's where the action takes place. Capillaries are just a single layer of epithelial cells, these flat displaying cells, really leaky. And that's where exchange takes place, is capillary. Anything above and below it is just hiding, it's just trapped, delivery of blood. Capillaries is where exchange takes place. All right, well, physics fluid. So fluid is going to move, or air, from high to low pressure. And all we care about is that pressure gradient. What's the difference? It doesn't even matter like the starting and ending numbers. It's just what's the difference in pressure? And so it's going to flow that direction. So our water pressure in this building, we've got somewhere there's a water tower that holds the water up high. It's going to cause pressure that causes it to flow. You know, it is the absolute value uh, between the two, this pressure difference. And the greater the pressure difference, the greater the flow. Yeah, it makes sense, right? 
there's only like a one one uh, degree difference in pressure. It's not going to move very far, but it's a huge pressure difference. That water can shoot out the other end, right? And so, how do we generate this pressure difference? The big old muscle in the heart, the vein. So this muscle is going to contract. Once it's filled up, it's going to contract. And blood or water is not very, um, what do you call it, compressive. So the pressure is going to increase, and that blood is going to look for the path of least resistance. So it's going to try to go back to the atria. There, those valves will snap shut. So it's got to go up the aorta, the pulmonary atria. And so once the pressure in that vector that's high enough, it's going to open up those valves and it's going to be ejected. It's going to squeeze out the blood. The pressure is going to be proportional to the force. So we'll see, as you get to be an old man or woman, your uh, heart muscle is no longer muscly and pliable. A lot of it turns into bad and connective tissue. And so you don't have that same force as not a strong muscle. Yeah. So that's the driving pressure of the vascular system is caused by this heart contracting on fluid and trapping. Here's a little test for you guys. Which one is, how's the flow going to differ? That was not a strong suit. I was a major, so I took the minimum of a little bit back with that. But I got through it, you know, I got through that. Uh, this is 25 different, is this 25? Thank you. So the flow is going to be identical, even though this is under higher pressure. See that 175? That's the bottom line. You know, whatever the difference is, it's going to have the same. All right, so very cool. Now we're looking at the pressure from this would be your ventricles, the aorta, the arteries. Look what happens. That pressure is dry, doesn't even happen. And then I was telling you, there's very little pressure left to bring it back to the heart. So why does it get so much smaller? Why does the pressure just go away? You, know? you work so hard to make the pressure in the aorta. Where do you lose it all? And I will tell you this. But listening to me, now if you think about this, this seems to be a paradox. Because you go from a big aorta, it's the biggest artery, right? To these tiny capillaries. Wouldn't you think the pressure would increase as you go from big to small, like that little thing you put on the garden hose? Yes. If the aorta is going to one capillary, if the aorta goes to millions of capillaries, so the cross section of the aorta is this big, the capillaries are like this big. So you actually go from smaller to bigger and you lose that pressure. And then just moving down the, the capillaries, just the distance like a pipeline, that friction, you know, these pressures. The length of the vessel. And then the main thing is, is that you go from some big, big vessels to just millions of little ones, and the cross section area is actually big. So that's kind of explains that paradox. And so you just lose pressure in the capillaries, it just dies. Oh, there's so much to see here. This is so interesting. If you notice in your, in your arteries, see that up and down? You got that diastolic and systolic. So if I feel like pulse at my wrist, I feel the pulse. It's pulsified. But notice that kind of goes away in capillaries. That's, that's what's so cool, too, is that in the arteries, you feel the pulse. But by the time you get to the capillaries, it's kind of just moving smoothly. Maybe a little bit of a jerk, but it's moving kind of smoothly. Yeah. And that's what you want in the capillaries. You want to move this very slowly. Stuff can exchange stuff along the capillaries. The arteries you want just to be moving, that pressure, push it to wherever the capillary is at. So, another thing that I noticed too is that here's systolic, the high one, here's diastolic. Why is it so high? Why doesn't it go from here to zero like so much? But it stays up here. I'll tell you the answer to that. The reason is, is that your Vessels have elastic in them, like rubber bands. So when when I feel my pulse at my wrist, I'm feeling my, my radial artery stretching. And then it's going to come back, that's going to release that pressure by coming back down. But then by the time it gets down here, it gets pushed out again. So your arteries have rubber bands in them, elastic tissue that allows them to stretch it and hold that energy and release it so it never drops. If your vessels were made out of PVC piping or copper piping, it would go up. To zero and 100, zero to 100. But because it's flexible, it holds that energy. And clearly, there's going to be a problem with the arteries. Your arteries aren't elastic. They just get solid, then your pressure and pore pressure will go down. But normally, you have 
healthy artery is going to hold that EGP, it's going to hold that energy in the elastic, but it will release it. Wow, all right. So I've talked a lot here, but there's a lot to show you, right? You can see how the pressure dives as you go down the system from your arteries. You see how it becomes pulsatile to moving smoothly almost. Yeah, and you can see how the diastolic pressure never gets too low because your, your arteries don't get a chance to completely go to zero before they're hit again with the heartbeat. So this is just a diagram of your, of your arterial system. And um, here's the key, okay? you've got capillary beds all of your body, so my muscles, my legs, my arms, my guts, my skin, my brain has capillary beds. And they're controlled by these sphincters that can open or close them. And if I were to open all the capillary beds in my body, I would just drop dead, there would be no blood pressure. So your body always has to keep some open and some closed to keep that blood pressure high. So you eat a big meal, your gut wants to open up, but necessarily your muscle ones, other places have to close to compensate. That's why it's not good to go swimming after you eat or exercise after you eat because you can't really open both capillary beds. They're not gonna die, I'm not told you that. You hear, you know, things like don't go swimming after you eat. You can't actually, but you know, it's gonna, you're gonna be competing for blood. Yeah, look at that. All right. And it's smooth muscle that's encircling these, uh, especially the arteries, and uh, they can constrict or relax. When I go in the hot tub, capillary beds in my skin open up and I turn red, and then they shut down elsewhere in my pores. If I go on the cold of the day, they close down my skin and they open up my pores. My body always is adjusting. If you get a shot of, a shot of adrenaline, your muscle, your muscle arteries, your brain are going to open up and your gut's going to close down because it's fight or flight. Uh, pre capillary sphincter, I think it was. Yeah, in the arterial. Yeah, pre capillary. It's in the capillary bed, and before it was little sphincters. And then I showed you there's like little shunts that kind of bypass capillary bed. The capillary bed's open, it means the blood's moving slowly through, and you're like using that tissue. You can close it down making shortcuts in that point. All right, let me just show you some chemicals that can that open or close this smooth muscle, constrict it. Um, ones that will um, constrict it, just because the ones in red I, I, I talked about. Um, when we talked about um, clotting, I told you that the platelets secrete serotonin, which will constrict the blood vessel and stop you from bleeding. That's that first step to keep you from homeostasis, not homeostasis, hemostasis. To keep you from bleeding is that it will constrict those vessels. And then just to bring you back to the beginning of this semester, ADH is going to make you uh, pee less, but it's also going to constrict, uh, constrict your blood vessels. So by peeing less, you're going to retain water, your blood pressure goes up. By constricting your blood vessels, your blood pressure goes up. ADH has a two-pronged approach to keep your blood pressure high. Retain water in your kidneys, and constrict your blood vessels. For ADH, the other name is vasopressin. What about things that relax the blood vessels? Well, I thought about histamine. So the ones in red, I'll ask you. The other ones I won't ask you. I'm a tester. So histamine, you know, is going to make your capillaries leaky. Then they'll also uh, open up, relax the smooth muscle to increase blood flow. So if I have an infection on my finger, I release heparin for blood flow and histamine. Going to open up the blood vessels so that so they deliver more blood. So it's red and hot and painful and swollen because the blood vessels are leaky. And then I actually have an effort, an effort. Uh, It has varying effects in different uh, arteries, so this is complicated. But normally I just talk about so uh, adrenaline will open up the blood vessels to your muscles and to your brain and to your lungs. So everything to make you fight or flight. Oh, I can't talk about the rest of it. Kind of cool. Yeah, I, I gave you this explanation earlier already. And so the reason why the pressure just drops in the capillaries is that you go to a much bigger cross-sectional area of tubes. Bigger cross-sectional area of tubes, the pressure decreases. Like in a river, where the river is narrow, it's moving really fast, but when it spreads out, it moves slower. 
same thing. You got to move the same amount of fluid per distance per time. This depends if you have a big deep river or a wide flat river. A big tube is for like a oil pipeline versus a small little straw. Ooh, all right. Again, here's what happens. Um, yeah, I'm more of a Spanish than I'm speaking French, but oh, here it is. Fazuli. Fazuli is long. It's, uh, we're going to talk about these are the factors that are going to influence flow. It's so important just for blood flow, it can be any flow. So, resistance. The more resistance you have, it's going to slow down the flow. Right? And the variables are length. L is length. So, how long is the blood vessel? And obesity is going to increase the blood pressure because you have more mild to mild capillaries, you're distributing more resistance. Um, this letter, whatever that is, is going to be the viscosity. viscosity. So it's much harder to pump maple syrup or honey than it is to pump water. So the more thicker your blood is, the harder it is to pump. And that's why I mentioned with blood doping. Some people do that to uh, increase performance. You, your blood can become so thick that you're, you can have a, your heart can fail I'll try to push this maple syrup. It does it as well. But the key is look at that radius, R to the freaking fourth power. That is a huge number. So look at the fourth power. So clearly the other two are important, but it's about the radius. And it's the denominator too. So the bigger the radius, the smaller the resistance is going to be. And that makes sense, right? The bigger the diameter, the less resistance. You know, like buying speaker wire. You can buy the cheapest speaker wire, it's really thin, or the expensive stuff is really thick. So the thin one is going to have more resistance. It's going to actually heat up. The wires can going to heat up. Um, so the bigger the wire, the less resistance, like electrically. If you're looking at hydrodynamically, the bigger the tube, the less resistance. I love it. So look at this difference. You're saying to yourself, okay, I'll get an artery radius of one. Let's just double it to two. Should that double the flow? It freaking goes from one to 16. So it's so that shows you the most important variable is that radius or diameter of that vessel. And your body can control that. It's got smooth muscle. It can control that. It's not like in your house where the pipes are all just solid. You can't control that, that flow. Well, you control it at the faucet. But here your body can control the diameter of the vessels. And then the more it squeezes them down, the less flow. So if I'm working on leg, I'm talking about my legs, I can open up those vessels and close the ones to my arms. The blood goes with it's stupid. It goes wherever the least resistance is. So there'll be more blood flow to my legs because there's less resistance. Your body always is changing the diameter. All right. Hopefully, I have impressed upon you the difference here in the radius. What a huge difference it makes to, to resistance and flow. Here, I can test you going through this. So, which one of these has the, have the greatest flow and will have? That's the least resistance. We'll have the greatest resistance and the least flow. So the bottom one's going to be the most resistance. It's going to be the least flow. The tiny little straw is long. These two have the same diameter as the middle two, but this one has less length. So in fact, this one will have will be full more. Right. Oh, I love this. This is so. This is the deal. So we're talking about having you know, a heart attack. Your coronary arteries and narrowing. I think that's going to test the question. I'm telling you ahead of time. Um, so like if your, your coronary artery narrows by 50%, then you have 50% less flow. I don't know. Um, only in 90% of these things will happen. Because what about to the flow of power? So let's take a look. Here's a healthy artery. You're moving 100 cubic uh, centimeters of blood per minute. And if you cut it by half, let's say you got hardy arteries that's half as big. You go from 100 to 6. And so theoretically, you'd have to have a blood pressure of 1,920 to move the same amount of blood. So you can see why it's a big deal that your coronary arteries get narrow because it blocks the flow, not just proportionally, but the power. And drugs open these up. Like, a, like you get a heart attack, you get number like nitroglycerin pills, put your tongue real quick. But uh, that's going to. Uh, Nitrous oxide is going to relax blood vessels in the heart and allow the blood to keep 
both these groups are different. Or an epipen can also increase your dock iron level. All right, so I love this because it really drives home, you know, how important radius is to flow. And that if you narrow something, yeah, it's really hard to push it through with your own star. Beautiful. All right. So there's the three uh, formula and three things. Uh, can you change your blood disguise? Well, it does. You can hydrate yourself, you can overhydrate yourself, you can uh, become anemic or make more blood cells, you can uh, starve yourself with proteins, not enough proteins in your blood. Um, so you can change the viscosity, but it's not a quick process. Can you change the length, the length how long your blood vessels are? Not really, no. Um, unless you have a lot of fat tissue during that, you can increase the number of blood vessels. But diameter, easy peasy. So blood vessels, just to let you know, they, um, there's always a tone called a vascular tone, vasomotor tone, where the blood vessels are always partly contracted. Again, if they're completely open and flaccid, your blood pressure is going to be so low. Or so good. There's always a tone, it's always a little bit. And it's not parasympathetic, has nothing to do with this, except it's very, but it's sympathetic nervous system. So either a sympathetic nervous system is um, giving a constant signal where it's like normal, or it like, increases its signal and it's going to constrict. So realize it's not having a break in a gas pedal, it's just a gas pedal. Either you're really constricted or you're dry. So sympathetic nervous system controls your blood vessel diameter in general. And here it goes. You know, you think yourself a big dude with a little cute. That's maybe he's pressure. But no, millions of years. Yeah, here we go. So here it is going from the large arteries. And this is misleading. You put one capillary, it's actually, you know, millions of So the diameter increases overall. And just one more showing the same thing you guys have already learned. Um, but you can see here that the blood slows down in the capillaries. And that's awesome. That's where you want to slow down. Because that's where they be transferred. It's beautiful. And the reason is the top one shows you the total cross-sectional area is much bigger. The bigger area, less resistance, slow And this shows you blood pressure, you're going to lose it in the capillaries. You can model this in physics here at UNE. I did a model, I tried to write a grant in the and some physics looking at more better, better modeling this to really show us. All right, again, the veins, it's so hard to get blood back to your body. I've said it uh, two or three times now. But in veins, don't forget that the muscular pump, the respiratory pump are going to help bring the blood that's lost all that pressure back. Yeah. Now this I even include, this is the pressure of the ventricle. So it does get down almost to zero, right? Because the ventricle contracts, that's the maximum pressure. Then it relaxes suction. It's like any suction as it fills up, it is going to come down. But once it pops into the aorta, the aorta is simply going to pulse. It's going to be pushed open during systole. It's going to come back. And before it can come all the way back, it's going to be pushed open again. So the pressure never gets to zero once you get into the arteries. And then the ventricles, if you have a sensor, you can pop it. All right, there's a formula I'm not going to ask you mean arterial pressure, like it's the average driving force of the body. But um, let's take a look at it. So, blood volume that makes a big difference. So, people with high blood pressure, they get these uh, little things of heat to get rid of the water. So, that's what it takes time, right? The kidneys to get rid of it. And then, cardiac output, of course, is going to be equal blood pressure. That's heart rate and stroke volume. That's cool. The resistance, big time. Yeah, so, that's going to have to do with. How big is your arteria? Less resistance for the big, more resistance for the big. And then this last one, if you um, remember, most of your blood is kept in your veins. And so if you want more blood to return, you can squeeze those veins. And it's kind of the veins that will return that blood to the rest of the system. That's kind of silly. All right, here's a couple of um, a couple uh, 
fun uh, things just to make sure you, you guys get it. And I think you got all this. It looks complicated, but it's not. Let's say you eat a bunch of chips. You're retaining all this salts, right? And so the salts will make you retain water. And your blood pressure is going to go up. So you're going to measure that, right? And your coronary arteries and your brain's going to say, gee, your blood pressure is too high. What are you going to do about it? Well, it's going to make you, over time, say, tell your kidneys, um, let's pee out some of this water. You're retaining way too much water. You're getting rid of the sodium, that's your sodium and the water. So that'll happen. And your blood volume will go down. That takes hours to do. So real quickly, what you can do is simply slow down your heart. Uh, it'll keep your pressure down. And then make your uh, vessels dilate to lower the pressure. All right, so that's putting together. This is kind of the view. I keep like repeating stuff, but these are the variables that are involved. All right, this is another thing that's really neat in your body, this machine that you carry around, is that blood flow will go to the muscles you're working. So let's say you're only working your right biceps, right bicep, right, yeah. right there. Your muscle is hot. It's, uh, if you looked at it, it'd be very, uh, lots of carbon dioxide, very acidic, carbon dioxide is carbonic acid. And so those vessels will open up. So the vessels in your right biceps will be open and blood flow will increase because there's got less resistance. And that's this uh, hyperemia, when certain tissues are really active, those vessels open up and less resistance, more blood flow. It's going to bring more oxygen, get rid of that carbon dioxide. So that's what it does. It opens up the vessels, so there's less resistance, thus greater flow, and blood flows to whatever tissues they have. Indeed. Yeah, this is again, one more thing to study. I'm happy to go over because I already have. And you realize what's going on here in the cardiac center and the medulla, understand where these rare receptors are, and understand parasympathetic or sympathetic, and affect your heart rates and how strong the heart is All right, this guy looks really bad. The blood pressure is hot. It is dangerously hot. It's getting really, really hot. So, how are you going to be aware of this? You're going to be aware of it because you're stretching this. If your are your nerves, you're going to be really stretched. Tell your brain, dude, calm down. Your blood pressure is way too high. You're going to have an aneurysm. So what's going to happen is that um, it's going to send signals to your increased parasympathetic, which is going to slow down your heart rate. It's going to slow down your heart rate, and it's going to decrease sympathetic, quite your blood. So that's going to make your heart contract less strongly, and then it's going to dilate your blood vessels everywhere. And that will bring down your blood pressure. Bigger the tubes, and so again, our big this is pretty simple. We decrease resistance, we decrease cardiac output, and bring the blood pressure back down. Last one, <laughs> she's standing up. You're standing up. Your blood pressure is going to drop. What's going to keep you from passing out? Well, you're going to notice that. The drop in pressure immediately because your your stretching of your arteries is going to be less, and it's going to make you increase your adrenaline. So it's going to speed up your heart, the force of contraction on this side. And over here, it's going to constrict your blood vessels. So there's more pressure. It's going to increase resistance, increase cardiac output. Blood pressure is this times this, and you have lower blood pressure. So, yes. Anything, I, anything I'm missing? I'm going too quick. As well. Yeah, you guys can look at this. Um, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. But uh, again, keeping your blood pressure normal, you guys spend so much time behind the scenes. You don't have to do it So much time doing this. That's why it's so critical to life. You can see here, it's just beautiful. It's like blood sugar, your body temperature, your blood pressure. Your body has all these uh, things in control. Oh, I love this. Look at this. See? Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's just me. But you're. Um, Cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. And then blood pressure is cardiac output times resistance. And see how everything, everything fits together. Everything fits together. I love it. You guys do it all the time. You, you, you should thank your Gabula. You don't have to think about this. It just simply takes care of it for you. It's so awesome. You got here a bag of salty pretzels. It don't care. It takes care of it for you, you know? Your kidneys and your, your heart work together to make you survive. All right, so a couple more days before we're going to finish it up here. Um, 
So the blood returns to your home. And it returns that right atrium, right? All the blood that returns back to your heart. So that's called your central venous pressure. If you were to measure in your right atrium, that is the blood that is returning to your heart. Now, as I mentioned, if your heart's failing, you can't get rid of that blood and it backs up. Yeah. So someone that can't keep up with that getting rid of the, the blood because their heart isn't strong enough, it backs up. And so where's it going to back up? Your inferior and superior vena cava. So your neck is going to swell, your limbs are going to swell. You're going to have water like coming out in your abdominal cavity. So if your heart is failing, the back pressure is going to cause more water to leave the capillaries and it's going to swell your tissues up. So the key thing is going to congest your heart failure is going to swell returns back your heart can't get rid of it. called edema. Edema is fluid in your tissues. Because if you remember, I showed a capillary bed and, and pressure was going to move fluid out, right? That's necessary. So this person has edema in their foot. If you push your finger in, it leaves a fingerprint. Now, what if the, let me ask you this, what if your left side of your heart cannot get rid of the blood. Where is it going to back up into? The left atrium, the left ventricle, the lungs. Because remember the lungs drain into the left side. So in my lecture I recorded last night, I'm going to talk about what happens. If the left side is failing, it could be the valve, it could be the muscles failing, the pressure in your lungs builds up, back pressure, because you can't get rid of it, and then fluid starts filling your lungs. Pulmonary edema, your lungs will become very fast. The right side can't get rid of it, it's going to back up in the inferior superior vena cava. So you're going to have swelling of your tissues. Uh, we can talk about pulse pressure. I think we both mentioned it briefly. But the pulse pressure is you're going to just take the systolic rise and diastolic. So the normal the numbers up here is about 40 millimeters of mercury. That's the pulse pressure. Um, yeah, and then when you look at the, you guys watch a medical show or do this in lab and read the pulse, you often see this little, call it dichrotic notch, this little notch here. Some people don't. Some people have a pulse. Some people have a little notch. Just so you think about it, it's going to, the pulse is going to go up as the ventricles squeeze the blood out of the aorta, right? It's going to squeeze, it's going to make that artery big. Then what happens is, as soon as it squeezes it out, the ventricle relaxes, makes a suction, the blood comes back a little bit, doesn't it? It's going to push out the aorta. And each time it pushes out, it comes back a little bit. It pushes it out, and the valve comes out. So that's why the little notch is, it explains up the notch. And uh, yeah, then I put this guy, some of you interested in athletics, is what happens um, is, uh, as your blood pressure goes up, is that both the diastolic and systolic go up? And a good athletes, the diastolic stays low, the systolic, you have a bigger or wider pulse pressure. You're actually getting rid of this distance, is how much your stroke volume is. So if you increase both, um, heart rates can help it go faster, but if you go, it just drops here. So this, there's some subtleties that I'm not going to talk about, but I think those of you that are interested. Yeah. Uh, all right, so let's talk about some things, uh, common diseases here. Uh, arterial sclerosis means, sclerosis means hard. So that means your arteries, hard in your arteries, arterial sclerosis. And atherosclerosis is the kind of this that it's a cholesterol builds up, but it's you're almost using a gene. But what happens is true is that um, your arteries, the inside, like I looked at a lot hundreds of cadavers, and I would say I never figured out, but at least like 70, 80 percent of them. If you look at the heart, their quarter arteries are crunchy. You can see the yellow plaque. It's like, so it's just and they found if you look at young people, like they look from people from the Korea War, Vietnam War that died in the 30s and 20s. This the part of the artery starts early in some people. It's genetic, unfortunately. But it's also diet and exercise it causes this atherosclerosis, smoking. Uh, so indeed, part of the arteries is, is a big issue um, because several there's several problems. One of it is it decreases the diameter. It's going to increase your blood pressure. It's more diameter, it's less flexible. Another thing is that it's rough. More clotting. So the blood, instead of being a smooth surface, it's going to clot. And then if a clot does form, let's say it's clot some forms in the legs, the narrow diameter is going to cause the clot to stop. 
That's in your heart or your brain. So, again, less flexibility, narrow diameter, it's almost always the cause of heart attacks is because you have arteriosclerosis in the heart arteries. An aneurysm is when the uh, artery balloons out. And often with this, when you have damage to the, the arteries, like arteriosclerosis, it makes the heart wall, I mean, the vessel wall weak and it can dissect or split open. And then you can have an aneurysm forming. And it's okay to have an aneurysm, I guess. But if that bursts, you're going to bleed like crazy because your aorta or anything like that. And that's why high blood pressure is so dangerous is because it can balloon out the arteries and the aneurysm and it hurts. All right, hypertension. So hypertension is high blood pressure. And as you know, there's no real numbers for too low blood pressure. Although I know people have they have too low blood pressure, they, they tend to faint and such, but you don't really go to that. High blood pressure is a really big issue. This number's actually changed a little bit. As he says, not well, I forgot already. <laughs> but you can see if you're over 140 and 90, uh, uh, you definitely have high blood pressure. And the danger with hypertension is that it's a silent disease like glaucoma. You walk around and the first symptom is a heart attack because you can't sense your blood pressure. So that's why. If you have health care, you guys have health care, you know, can have checkups. But if you don't, you can walk around high blood pressure for decades. So I think it's important for regular checkups. At least go to the right end, you know, check your blood pressure. So hypertension, asymptomatic. You don't know until something happens. Oh, like osteoporosis, too. Talk about that. You don't know until now at the simple fall. But this one. Um, so if you have checked, they find it, they give you drugs, and they can. Not, not the answer always, but they can fix it. So it's important to have it tested constantly. A billion people worldwide, oh my God, 20% of Americans, one third don't even know. So again, you walk around and you're getting constant checkups, you don't know this. So what are the, what's the cause of hypertension? Well, I want you to come home today with this. That hypertension can have several different causes. You gotta see what the cause is to see where to cure it. Okay? Um, uh, clearly, when you have arteriosclerosis, you're hardening the arteries, you're going to have higher blood pressure, and it can no longer stretch, and so your blood pressure can be higher. Um, we'll talk about kidney. Kidney gives off this uh, hormone that makes an angiotensin that's going to increase your blood pressure. So people with uh, kidney disease can't make this hormone, hormone, and then their blood pressure goes up. Too much sodium. So if your, pro if your problem is too much sodium, that's pretty easy. Instead of sodium chloride for salt, you can get potassium chloride, get less sodium, things like that. So that eating less salt, you know, a lot of grandpa and grandma do not know how to have salt. Or taking um, antidiuretics and making chemo. Obesity, of course, and, and exercise is going to help with that. And then if you're always stressed, you're going to have high blood pressure because you always have cortisol and uh, adrenaline in your system. So many treatments. Um, you can control your sodium intake, try to reduce stress. Drug wise, diuretics make you pee more. That'll keep more of your blood pressure. Um, beta blockers, the parallels, various laws, can, uh, can uh, uh, bind to their adrenaline receptors in the pacemaker. Even though you're, you're stressed, your heart rate won't go up. And then there's this thing called ACE inhibitors and ARBs that influences other hormones that can make your blood pressure go up too. So it depends on what your issue is and where you want to go. All right, last slide, exercise. So, I think it's a minute for a But I, you guys know that uh, obviously exercise is, is, uh, is good for you. And I show you in my last lecture, I talked about cardiac heart rate and stuff like that. But why is it that um, people die and just jump on the snow? He's exercising, it's good for you. <laughs> you don't want to be sedentary, then I'm going to run a 5 to run. That was a huge shift. In so, your heart is a muscle that you work out, just like your other muscles. And if you have consistent uh, exercise, your heart will build just like any muscle, and you'll have strong stroke muscles. Strong heart. People die all the time that stress their heart. They get angina, chest pain, or a heart attack, and they can die uh, very easily. So, um, the world, you know, everyone exercise, we have a lot less pain. All right, people, perfect. I mean, perfect. All right. I'll see you guys later. <clears throat>